And in Genesis 28, verse 10, it says, Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran, came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head, literally put it at the head place. He did not sleep on the stone. He put it at the head place where his head would be laid, all right? And it's really important revelatory-wise that you understand that. And lay down in that place. And he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. I'm going to read it to you as it is in the Hebrew. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I, comma, I did not know. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I, capital I, comma, small I, I did not know. I'll let you think about that. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And we will trust Father to add his blessing to the public reading of his word. You may be seated on your way down. Tell somebody the dawn is breaking. Now, the fact is, is that when you look at the Hebrew words here about... Jacob alighting or happening upon a certain place in the Hebrew the context is a certain place and Jacob had a collision and I've already shared this but I need you to understand in the journey towards the dawn is breaking you are on a collision course with the favor of God I want you to get a little bit excited about this, but I want you to realize that there is a place you are headed towards, and even if you feel like you don't like collisions, this is a happy accident. How many of you could use a few happy accidents? How many of you believe that when the word goes forth, it will not return void without accomplishing the purpose for which it was sent out? The preached word is the word of faith, and I am not simply sermonizing. I am declaring to you an utterance by the Spirit that has prophetic power to activate and open up for you a gateway because this is what the gate of heaven is about. It's not just about something that happened millennia ago to the patriarch Jacob. God wants you to find the gate of heaven and you're on a collision course with it. I'm going to have you talk back to me today. And so that word happened upon is paga. Everybody say paga. And it suggests a dynamic encounter with an object that is traveling towards you as you are traveling towards it. There is something that God intends to bless you with that is already traveling toward you. 
I have this sense that when we read Paul and he talks about the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, it's the same concept, that you are on a collision course with grace, mercy, goodness, power, blessing, favor, access, release, multiplication, acceleration, all the stuff that God promises goes with walking with Him because when you've got Him, you've got no need. Somebody needs to get a little more excited. And so, this certain place we've already established is a place that knew jo Jacob, but Jacob didn't know the place. This is Moriah. And these stones aren't just any stones. According to Hebrew tradition, these are the stones Abraham arranged as an altar and laid the father of Jacob on top of to sacrifice him in obedience to what God required. So when Jacob gets there, while Jacob doesn't know the place, the place knows him. There is somewhere you're going and you don't know where it is, but it knows you and has been waiting for your arrival. And it's a place in the Spirit, as Paul tells us, we have been seated in heavenly places. And the word is plural, not to describe that you got a place, you got a place, you got a place, but there are lodging places in progressive movements of faith because you go from glory to glory and from faith to faith. And the word places there is the word used even with Naomi and Ruth when she says, wherever you lodge, I will lodge. They're on their way somewhere and every stopping place is a place that brings you that much closer to the ultimate place and it's always an upward journey. Look at somebody and say, I'm finally going to get my deluxe apartment on the east side. <laughs> going to move in next to Louise and her husband. And so traditionally the certain place is Moriah where Jacob's father was bound on that altar of stones. Now, what you need to understand is that that is the future site of the temple that Solomon builds. This is the place where David purchases the field from Arana and pays a price for it after the battle where the angel struck the enemies and then struck the Israelites because David counted the people. Okay, how many remember that story? But this is the same place. This is the Dome of the Rock. Why is it called the Dome of the Rock where the Mosque of Omar is? Is because that rock is considered by the Jews and by the Muslims to be the foundation stone of the world. It is at that place, and I've been to the holy city, it is at that place where Jacob laid his head. He didn't sleep on the rock. The stones were arranged so that it was the head rock, and he laid his head at the head place. Why is that important for you and I? Because your head is the focal point of where the shift is going to take place. Are you with me? That's why the head place is so important. And in the dream, Jacob is having an encounter with God himself. Okay? He lays his head at the head place. Now, he's exhausted. All right? Jacob is exhausted. He's running away from his past. And there might be a few of you in the room that are trying to still run away from your past. And while he's running away from his past, he's running to a future that he has no guarantee about. 
And God wants to meet him in the middle of his past and in his present so he will wake up to God's presence. The whole dream is designed for Jacob to wake up. What good is a dream if you don't wake up and realize it? The whole purpose of sleeping is so you can wake up the next morning. Not good to go to sleep and not wake up. It's just, it's not good. Especially if you're supposed to wake up at 7 and you wake up at 11 and your boss has a few things to say about that. Not good. So the whole purpose of sleeping is to rejuvenate you so you can wake up. Look at somebody say, it's time to wake up. The dawn is breaking. Don't miss your morning. And here's the thing. The moment Jacob gets there, the sun sets. God never begins in the light. God begins in the dark, but he won't start until you arrive at the end of your limited light. So you don't really learn how to pray until you pray in the dark. Right now, some of you are trying to figure out you're into this consecration and you're saying, I don't know what's going on. It's because you're praying in the dark. <laughs> Why? Because the dark is when God starts. There's evening and morning the first day. And no matter how many times I say this, it seems like a fresh revelation every time I say it. But God always begins in the evening. You can't work at night. Even though some of you may work the graveyard shift, in God's economy, you can't work the night season. Only God can see in the dark. And when it's dark, God wants you to rest in trust that he's working on your behalf. So your prayer in the dark doesn't need to be a prayer of fear. It needs to be a prayer of faith. How many of you are willing in this season to learn how to pray the prayer of faith in the dark instead of asking God to keep turning a light on? How many of you are facing stuff that you're in the dark about? All right. And how many of you are asking questions you haven't got answers for yet? Uh, change the way you pray. Lay your head at the center of the universe. What is the center of the universe? David said, lead me to the rock. And again, this was Mount Zion. Uh, uh, this was the foundation stone, the rock that's at the center, the axis mundi, all of that stuff. It's all talking about the same rock, the rock that followed them in the wilderness. You want to lay your head, your consciousness, your cognitive processes, your reflection, your perception. You got to lay those. Th How many of you know it's hard to turn your mind off? How many of you know what it's like to sit at night, watch TV, and you start to doze off, you say it's time to go to bed, and you're so tired, and you're so mellow, because TV's so boring that it puts you to sleep, and then you lay your head on the pillow, and the movies start playing. And the questions start coming. And the issues of what you got to do tomorrow. I may know what I'm talking about. It's very, very common in a day of rapid, unprecedented, accelerated, unasked for change for us to have to cope with the fact that our circadian rhythms are off. We sleep when we're supposed to be awake. And we're awake when we're supposed to sleep. And then you talk back to yourself and say, why in heaven's name am I thinking about this at one o'clock in the morning? I read all this in a book. And you wonder why you need Starbucks or St. Arbucks every morning. 
And so the dark, the dark wants to tell you it's blocking the blessing. But God wants you to understand the dark is so you can go to sleep and rest because he gives to his beloved even in their sleep. Job is told that God seals your instructions while you're sleeping. All of us need to learn how to rest in the dark. Can I keep going? Here's this moment where Jacob lays his head at the head place and he's got the main stone where it is and he's rearranged the other stones now what he doesn't realize is that in rearranging the stones he's redefining his place in the covenantal blessing because the way Abraham laid the stones is not the way he's gonna lay them what worked in a former generation they leave you their legacy but you have to learn how to take what they left you and arrange it in a way that works for your generation. Yes, yes. Uh, 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 am I talking to anybody? I'm not saying abandon what we got from our Abrahams and Isaacs. I'm saying you're on a collision course with places your ancestors in faith have gone, but when you get there, there is going to be some creativity involved because the God who gave you the promise is going to take you a little further, and that's going to require a rearranging of things. So in the dark, things get rearranged. Look at somebody and say, I'm in a season where some things are getting rearranged. And I'm decluttering my life. But what I don't realize in the decluttering in this season is I'm making room for a new dawn to break in my season of life. And if I'm talking to you right now, give God a shout. See, now, now Jacob didn't know when he was rearranging the stones whose stones they were or that he was rearranging them. He was just trying to survive. In dark seasons, we go into survival mode and we battle exhaustion. I know I'm not talking to anybody in the room. Jacob is fearful and troubled because his brother is out to get him. But mama and daddy have both given him instructions about moving into the future. Mama has told him, your brother wants to kill you, get out of here. She's the same lady that said, put on the skins, go and tell your father you prepared the blessing. She's already telling him, you know, she gives the good news and the bad news. Isaac, his father, says, you're going to take a bride from the daughters of our people. So Isaac gives him a hint of where his blessing is going to come from. He needs both of their input, okay? But what I want you to understand is that when Jacob, when Jacob falls asleep, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, at his head place, there is a ladder that starts at his head and goes all the way to heaven. And it said the ladder touched the ground. Everybody say, the ladder, the ladder touched the ground. At the head place. If you are going to accomplish anything in God, it begins by learning how to ground truth. You have to learn how to be grounded in truth. Some of us are grounded in uncertainty. Some of us are grounded in worry. 
Some of us are grounded in fear. Some of us are grounded in anger. Some of us are grounded in the need to control everything and everyone in our world just so that we feel better. None of that is healthy. Which is why grounding begins when you lay down and rest. Say, I now ground. I now ground. Every new insight, Every new insight. God, gives God gives by resting in it, resting. And, acting on it. and acting on it. It's not enough to hear a revelation, you've got to ground it. Which means you've got to do things that anchor it in an earthy, earthly perspective. The ladder is touching the earth. It reaches to heaven, but it is grounded in the earth. See, you ever heard the expression, too heavenly minded, not enough earth, has, with no earthly good? You've got to be grounded. Stay with me. And all of a sudden... In this grounded position of this ladder, he notices that there are angels ascending and descending. Now, here's what you need to realize. The angels are not moving in the same way that Jacob moves. Jacob is running from his past and running into his future. So Jacob is going in the horizontal. Which means unless he gets grounded in what he's seeing, he will repeat his past in his future. And there was silence in Orlando for the space of a half hour. Have you ever heard the expression, the hurrieder I go, the behinder I get? You and I need to understand how easy it is to fall into the trap of running from our past and running to our future and missing the fact that going to and fro doesn't always satisfy. With every seed you sow, there's a harvest you grow. And God has a harvest in these last days of souls that he is wanting his people to sow into. And he will bless them for it and establish them in the covenant. I invite you to sow a love gift right now, a love seed into the soil of Mark Sharona Ministries for the sake of the harvest. Sow a $33 love gift right now. And let me put in your hands this powerful brand new series, The Dawn is Breaking. It will encourage, uplift, confirm, and establish you further in what God is doing in this season. Six messages, CD or DVD, your choice for your love gift of $33 or more. If you'll sow a love gift of $53 or more, I'm going to give you an additional companion series entitled, God is going to bless you no matter what. And that six series message is going to add to what you're hearing in the dawn is breaking. I promise you, it will indeed bless you. And for those of you that will sow a $73 love gift or more this month. I'm also going to include prophetic prayer cards with decrees from this entire emphasis on the dawn breaking that can direct your prayers, direct your declarations, and direct your confessions in a way that will establish further realms of faith and access to your heavenly blessing in Christ. Call that number now. Sow your best love gift, 33, 53, or 73, and let me put these resources and tools in your hands to empower and equip you to move further in the life Christ has for you.